Welcome back to Podcast Recovery, everyone. We are your hosts, David O. And Eric V. And Allie B. Woo. That went swimmingly. That yeah. went so well. It'll be better in that. person, you know? Right. We'll be more fluid, you know? I think the delay is yeah. still like... Yeah. It'll be great in 2021. When, once 2021 <laughs> hits, it'll be fantastic. All right. So today we are joined by our very special guest, Ken. How are you doing today? I'm wonderful. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Where are you from, Ken? Uh, I live just outside of Pittsburgh, about 30 minutes north. I, I think you guys are Baltimore, right? So the whole Raven Steeler thing, do I have to worry about that I, here? I, I was just yeah, going to have I that. thought about that. As soon as you said Pittsburgh, I immediately went, yeah. my brain went there. Yep. 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 We'll, 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 keep, we'll keep it all civil today. <laughs> oh, but after the podcast, it's on. I assume you're going to hang up on me now. I get to stay on? Yes. yes. Are, are you a Steelers fan? You're not from Boston. Ken, are you a Steelers <laughs> fan? Uh, I'm actually not. I'm, I'm much more of a hockey fan here than okay. I am a football fan. I'm not just. I'm not just saying that to appease you guys, but but I do live with uh, with a bunch of Steelers fans. My, my sons especially. So. Well, my condolences to that. Yeah. We won't yeah. hold that against you. Well, I we might. It. We might. <laughs> All right. So when when were you first introduced to recovery, Ken? Um. So 2006, I got sober for the first time. It was uh, late, I guess, probably November of 2006, and I went through an outpatient program for three months. And as soon as I got out, I went right back out, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But then I had so like nine more months, eight or nine more months of uh, drinking, and then got sober the second time, uh, October 12, 2007, and I've been sober ever since. Well, you just answered my last question with how long you've been clean. So, what, 12 years, you said? Yeah, yeah, 12 and a half, yeah. So this October will be 13. Right. That's awesome. awesome. Congratulations. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And with all that out of the way, we're going to turn it over to you to share your story with us. So take it away. Okay, cool. Well, thanks again for having me, guys. And, uh, you know, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I'm supposed to share with you um, what I was like, what happened, and, and what I'm like today. And so I'll try to do that. Um, and, and I'll start by telling you what I was like. Um, and I would start by saying that I was not a good person. I was a liar. I was a cheater. I was a thief. I was a bad husband. I was a bad father. I was a bad employee, bad friend, you name it. Um, I was not a good person at all. But I, if you would have uh, approached me with any of those ideas back then, I would have, I would have sincerely been surprised and, and disappointed because I didn't realize you know, yeah. how selfish I, the uh, the disease had made me. I, I thought I was a wonderful person, and you know, in, in hindsight, it showed me that that was just not the case at all. And I could fight example after example, but, um, but I, yeah, I did want to mention that. And, and I'll just tell you that I grew up, you know, I, but I, I, I would say a pretty normal, uh, American upbringing in the seventies and eighties. And, you know, alcohol was part of the, the family, um, you know, Christmas time, 4th of July, that kind of thing, but it wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't a prominent factor. It wasn't something that I kept thinking, Oh boy, I can't wait until I'm old enough to drink. I didn't, I wasn't against it. It just, it wasn't a factor in my life, really. Um, you know, I spent mm -hmm. some time around it, but um, I actually didn't start drinking until I was 21. I, you know, I wasn't one of those kids sneaking off at the graduation party at 14 uh, with the beer. I just had no interest in it. I really didn't. It's kind of funny in mm -hmm. retrospect. It just wasn't something that, that appealed to me at all. And um, But once I did start drinking, I mean, I... I always say that I was, I drank alcoholically right from the start. Um, there was no build up with me. Um, you know, I know science is somewhat split about the whole genetic hereditary factor, but I believe that there is certainly, uh, at least a hereditary component there because it does run in my family. Um, yeah. I have an older brother, I have an older brother who died at 50, um, from cirrhosis, uh, just after yeah. when I got nine months sober, I turned nine months sober the day that he died. And, and you know, so I, I, I've seen the devastation that, that the disease can can cause up up close and personal. And um, but again, I don't I don't blame anybody in my family. I don't you know hold mm -hmm. anybody accountable. I did what I did on my own. Um, yeah. 
And uh, and like I said, I you know I was a blackout drinker right from the start. I was you know to me right right from the get go, it was get all you can, and and why would you ever stop? I mean, I was mm-hmm. never able to to turn it off. There was no off switch. And back then, I didn't know. I didn't know what alcoholism was until I got into the rooms AA. And in yeah. rehab, you know, to me, it was the guy under the bridge with the trench coat and the brown bag, that whole thing. And I didn't, I wasn't, <laughs> you know what I mean? I could, I, I mean, I was somewhat functional, at least early on. And, you know, it was a real eye opener for me when I was told, and when I read in the big book that it's all about control. What happens after we take that first drink? That was a real mm-hmm. test face to me because that was it. That was me completely. Once I started I had no no ability to say that's enough. I never ever said I'm good. I'll see you guys later. That never happened. No, no. Um, and so I mean, there was just there was no way. And I marvel at people who are able to do that because you know I I just never was. And and again, so I didn't back then. I didn't associate that with alcoholism only because of my you know ignorance. I didn't know what the disease of alcoholism was. I mean, so it took me getting to rehab and and into the rooms of AA to learn all that. But, um, but I was, you know, I did have the mental obsession right from the start too. I mean, it, I, I was mm-hmm. never really an every, everyday drinker only mainly because of situations. I mean, I was, I got married young and, I, you know, we had kids young. So I mean, there were, there were other factors that kept me from being a daily drinker. I would have, but mm-hmm. I certainly had the mental obsession. I mean, I was, if I wasn't drinking, I was plotting and scheming. Ways it sounds, that, sounds like a reservation. Oh, I totally would have been a day drinker. Right, absolutely. I mean, you know, I was always plotting ways to get away from my wife or scheming ways to hide some money away from her so that I could drink, you know, that kind of thing. I think we all do that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to figure out ways to get away from my wife. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Dan would never do that to you. I'm sure he does it a lot, actually. (laughs) Um, He spaces out. (laughs) <laughs> okay but anyway so that, that's yeah that's that's kind of what it was like for me you know i, I mean i could tell you lots of stories but I'll, everybody likes a good story so i'll just tell you a couple that just you know so i qualify myself in a program here um mm-hmm. yeah you know, i was thinking today about some stuff i could tell you i remember one time so my wife and i were married and we had our, our kids were pretty small when i got sober my my oldest I have four kids. My oldest was nine and my youngest was five and I've got four crammed in there. So we had four kids real close together. And, um, so I woke up one day, it was, I can't remember like eight or eight thirty. I was laying on the dining room table. I wake up laying, I'm sorry, under the dining room table. And this wasn't unusual for me to be waking up on various, you know, floors in strange parts of the house, bathroom floor, you know, whatever kitchen floor. So on this day, I wake up, it's like 8 or 8.30, I wake up on the dining floor, nobody's around, you know, and I'm like, this is the time of day that my wife should have been getting the kids ready to go to school, Uh you know, like preschool, whatever, nobody's around, and I right away started to panic, because she, she had never really threatened to leave me, but we were getting close to that territory where, I mean, I knew it was, you know, that I was on, this was toward the end of my drinking, and I knew that, you know, her taking the kids and leaving was a possibility. So that's where my mind went right away. It's 8, it's mm-hmm. 30, whatever. Nobody's around. So I called her mother in a panic. And I'm like, where is she at? You know, where's Chris? Like, And she's like, Ken, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, Chris and the kids, nobody's here. And she said something like, oh, she said she was taking the kids to the park when I talked to her earlier. So you probably figured out the end of this. It wasn't 8 o'clock in the morning. It was 8 o'clock at night. And, I, you know, I had Whoa. been in I had probably been in and out of a bender for, you know, who knows, a couple of days, maybe just, you know, the whole weekend. I don't remember the specifics, but, you know, so that, that would be, that's bad enough, but the story doesn't end there. So I, you know, my heart comes back to a normal rate. She tells, you know, I'm like, oh, thank God, you know, Chris hasn't left me. And I'm like, start calculating right away. How much money do I have on me? And uh, what time is it? Oh, wait, I think I, I still got time to go get some liquor. So I, I remember running up. She had the car. We only have one. I ran up to the, here in Pennsylvania, we have state stores, you know, I don't know what the situation in Maryland is, but you can only buy liquor in Pennsylvania in a state store. Mm-hmm. Oh. And uh, so I run up and I run up and buy myself a pint of vodka and get right back at it. You know, so it wasn't, I was terrified that she had left me, but not so much uh, to keep me from drinking again that night. So uh, <laughs> there was another time, one more, one more quick one, and then I'll, I'll get into what happened. Um, there was another time I, I come to on the living room floor this time, and I see 
flashing lights out, you know, on the living room wall. They're red and white, red and blue flashing, you know, lights. And I look outside and there's an ambulance at front of our place. And my wife's outside talking to the ambulance, the EMTs or whatever. And I'm like, what mm-hmm. the heck, you know? And right away I put two and two together. Like they're there for me. Like she's clearly, I don't know. And, you know, I'm probably coming out of a two day bender or something. And, you know, maybe I was non-responsive and she called the, the ambulance. And so I'm like, well, I'm certainly not getting in the ambulance. You know, so I like quickly like figure out where I had hidden my last bottle and I grab it and run out the back door. It's like two in the morning. And yeah, you know, there's, there's only so many places you can go in a small town at two in the morning carrying a bottle of vodka. You know I mean? Mm-hmm. You can't just walk into the public library, you know? So I remember like running to the community clerk and going and just, I can't remember so vividly just sitting there you know, I'd like mix the vodka with like water from the water fountain. I couldn't drink vodka straight, even at the end. Like, I, I admire anybody oh, who put a vodka bottle to their lips. God bless you, because I could never do that. Uh, at least I never got to that point. I'm sure I eventually would have. But so we had like cut it with uh, with water from the drinking fountain. I'm sitting there, you know, the soap park, middle of the night. There's an ambulance at my house, and I'm just, you know, thinking like. Look at look at what has come to your life. I mean, this isn't normal. This isn't the way normal people drink, you know. But it's just, no. it's just the way it was, you know. Yep. So I just I just give you those stories as, as you know, trying to qualify myself uh, yeah. for the program. But um, but anyway, so that's I guess that's kind of what I was like. And now I'll tell you what happened uh, that, that eventually got me into recovery. And so at that point, I was working. Um, I had lost a couple jobs because of drinking. So I was working, um, for the postal service, you know, they do like a, a hiring for the holidays. And I was just like, it was an overnight shift, like, I don't know, mm-hmm. nine and like three in the morning or something. And that was another thing I liked because I would get done and everybody would be in bed. So I could like drink when I got home at three in the morning and nobody would be around to bother me. But anyway, so on this particular day, I had to go to work, like, so in the, in the evening and I had a toothache and I remember saying to Chris, you know, I know I didn't go to work, but do you care if I have a beer like this Tuesday so won't go away? Of course, I could have taken Tylenol or something, but what fun would that have been, right? So I have a beer, nothing happens. I have another beer, nothing happens. I have a third beer, and, you know, there we go. I, it's, the beer works, it's, it's uh, wonders, and I start feeling better. So anyway, I cut to the chase. I, next thing I know, I wake up on the living room couch. I don't know, I'm not sure what time it is, but it is some time where I should still be at work. And I've been in a blackout the whole time. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier, but I was a blackout drinker pretty much from the, from the get I, I pretty, I, I think we all picked that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I wake up on the couch. It's, I don't know, let's say it's 1.30 in the morning. And I knew right away I should have been at the post office. And my first thought is, Maybe I didn't go. Maybe I drank and, and never made it there. But I kind of, you know how it is, like in the haze, I kind of had some images that I thought, no, 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 you know, I, I actually did go into work. Um, but, you know, the whole thing was a blur. I had gone to work, worked apparently, at some point just left work, drove home, all of this in the back. I had no idea what had happened. And, um, you know, I stumbled up to bed. The next morning I wake up and my wife's standing at the foot of the bed just looking at me with this mixture of hate and pity it was just it was just an awful look and yeah. you know it was just i had never really thought about honestly i'd never really thought about myself in terms of being an alcoholic or anything but mm-hmm. at that moment i just knew i mean it just i said to her i started crying i said i need help i mean i just knew that you know and uh so that that's kind of started my journey i really i picked up a yellow pages that day and booked under i don't know what you're looking at or alcoholism or recovery and, and got myself into a uh, a 90 day program. You know, I was like a model patient, you know, um, for those 90 days, I, everything, you know, life starts getting better. Um, and then the end of this story isn't a good ending because the, what happened at the time seemed like it was the best thing that could have happened really was the worst thing that could have happened. I don't think I mentioned you guys earlier, but my, my profession by trade, I'm a reporter and so I had always uh, kind of admired those guys who got to work, like, for, you know, national publications or, you know, any kind of job we get, do some traveling, go to a conference, or, you know, drink on somebody else's dime, you know, that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. I, like, fell right into that kind of job. Right after I got sober, there was this, um, this Pittsburgh company was kind of a startup. They were covering the steel industry. And I didn't really know anything about steel, but, like, 
the guy that was running the thing and me, we kind of had similar backgrounds. It just kind of hit it off. And I got that job right away. And I'm like, you know, it's, it's just look at the miracles of this program. I'm sober. I get this great job, you know. But it was, you know, right away I knew, like, here I, we, you know, it was the kind of thing where I was going to get to travel around the conferences and stuff. And I, I, I don't remember making the conscious decision, but I knew that I was not going to let a little thing like the fact that I knew I was alcoholic stand in the way of me finally getting to drink like a real reporter should, you know, traveling around the country, you know, hobnobbing with CEOs and and uh, drinking on an expense account. So, you know, I was, uh, it was real, real quick after I got out of... Uh, rehab I was I was back off to the races for another I don't know it was like eight or nine months I think and that went very badly as you can imagine because at that point I knew I had learned you know I knew I was alcoholic so I mean I knew better that time I couldn't kid mm-hmm. myself anymore but you know I still just you know frustration I wanted to drink the way I wanted to drink somebody else was you know, buying all the time I, I got to go on the road, these conferences and meeting, you know, the rich and famous of the shoe industry. <laughs> and, um, and so that ended, um, badly, as you can imagine, I, um, uh, I've lost my train of thought here. So I, here's what happens. I, I go to a conference in New Orleans. They send me down there of all places for four nights. And I don't remember any of I mean, I was basically drunk on Bourbon Street the whole time I was down there. I don't know. I know I couldn't have done any work. And there was a, <laughs> and there was another girl from the company. She was like a salesperson or something there with me, and, and apparently I had you know made some indiscretions with some other young ladies that were the top. You know, just bad behavior. I can't. Uh, she, okay. she had witnessed some of it, you know. So um, I get home, and my boss was out of town at that point. He was like in China or something, you know. So he, she's ready to tell him all the stuff that had happened, and he's not around. And, um, so eventually, oh, so I should mention too, but all this is all going on. I'm still like going through the motions going to go on to AA, you know, for my wife's benefit. I mean, I think she kind of knew, she knew like, my idea was I would only drink like while I was on the road. Oh, well, you know, and you can imagine how that went, you know? So yep. of course it like bleeds into like daily life and she knew I was drinking. It wasn't something like we really talked about, but I'm still going through the motions, um, going to AA meetings or pretending to anyway. So on this particular night where the whole thing comes crumbling down, I tell her I'm going to an AA meeting. Oh, oh one more important thing I should mention. We're, we're, at this point, things have gotten to the point where we're living with my wife's mother. You know, we had, we had been evicted from our house. We, things were just so bad, you know. And so we're living at her mother's now. I tell her I'm going to an AA meeting. Of course, I, I had no intention of going to an AA meeting. I went to the state store, and I couldn't take the, the bottle back to her mother's house, so I was sitting in a Walmart parking lot drinking. And so next next thing I know, there's a policeman rapping at the window. You know, I guess I passed out at the wheel. They don't know what to do with me. You know what I mean? I wasn't driving. In fact, I didn't get a DUI. So I think technically they can probably charge you with one. Mm-hmm. And so he takes me to, I spend the night in the holding cell, you know, and I wake up the next day and they, you know, give me my, my sign. You're free to go, whatever. So I leave, and of course, I hadn't even talked to my wife. She had no idea where I was all night. So I call her, you know, I'm just feeling, you know, the, the, the four, the hideous four horsemen, you know, hitting me incredibly hard that morning. Mm-hmm. And um, I call her and tell her, you know, oh, I've spent the night in jail. And I, I tell her I'm going to kill myself, you know, because, I mean, I'm a coward. And, of course, I had no intention of doing that, but I wanted to share the misery. I tell her I'm suicidal, and she's like, uh... crying. You know, and she says, why don't you call your sponsor, Randy? And I'm like, all right, all right, I'll, I'll go see Randy just to get her off the phone. So I go get the car, and I'm, you know, going to go see Randy. And oh, but then it, it dawns on me, this is a work day. Like, I'm supposed to be working, you know? And, um, so, and this is where we get to the point where I told you my boss that time. So he calls me, and you know, calls this big meeting in town for me to attend because of these allegations that this, co-worker of mine had made. So I'm heading to this big meeting downtown with him and we have this big knockdown drag out. You know, I, oh, by the way, I stopped to, to get a bottle on the way there. So I'm already drunk, or at least well on my way. At this meeting with my boss. And this, this other girl who was there with me, she, she's like, Ken, are you drunk now? And I'm like, how dare you? You know, I'm, I'm just indignant that she would say that. You know, we had this big knockdown drag out fight in. And at the end, my boss kind of takes my side somehow, miraculously. He's like, ah, at least I think you're being kind of hard on Kenny. He's 
he's all right, you know. And so I leave there, and um, I'm heading, I guess, back to my mother-in-law's house. Anyway, so it's here's you know how these things go. It's like you know I'm in and out of uh, consciousness. So next, thing, I come to in the library. I'm sitting at a library table, and I'm like, oh, I wonder what I'm doing here. So I go out, I leave to get in my car. The car is nowhere to be found. I call, I call my wife. She gets her mother's car. Comes. We're driving all around the library trying to find where is that this car, and we find it about a mile away. So at some point after I leave to meet my boss, I go. Park the car a mile away from this library, walk to the library. Now we find the car. I get out to get in the car. It's still running. Mm. So, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, what? I was just completely out of my mind at that point. So I leave the car running and I, so I, anyway, we get back to her other's house and this is where, this is where it ends for me, or where it begins for me. And I, I remember like walking up to the door saying to her, my wife, <laughs> excuse me, a pretty religious person and I never really watched him. I remember saying to her, like, you know, you're God. He better make an appearance, you know, and he better make it right about now, you know. And um, and that was it. That was it. The next day, I, I went back to to rehab, the same rehab again. You know, I, I, even though I knew, like, pretty much all the lessons they were going to teach me, which was really heavy on AA, getting back into the AA program. Mm. And, um, and, and, you know, I was going to say, the funny thing about the my comment about her God making appearance is like when I, I didn't have any idea what AA was about. I really didn't. I mean, what I pictured, it was nothing like what I was imagining, you know, I don't know, some kind of therapist, like running the meetings and that kind of thing. And, yeah. and when I found out that it was like heavily spiritually based, I was kind of disappointed. Not because I didn't <laughs> like that idea, but because I thought I was in a good position with God. Like I was like, Oh God, oh, this is about God and spiritual. Oh, I'm, I'm good there. You know, but really, it was a complete joke. I mean, I had no relationship with God whatsoever. I, I, uh, I mean, I would call on God, you know, to rail against him if things weren't going my way or to, you know, beg for help when things were going really bad. You know, I had, mm-hmm. I had no spiritual, I had no real healthy spiritual relationship with God at all. Uh, and, and I was able to get that through hey, over time, you know, obviously it takes a lot of time. And, and I remember, um, you know, reading in the big book that, you know, that whole idea of getting off the fence really hit me in the face. You know, God is everything or he is nothing. You know, what was our choice to be? I mean, that that really, really hit home with me. And, and right around that same time, I remember running into a, a quote from Albert Einstein, where Einstein said basically the same thing, where he said, um, you know, there's only two ways to live your life. One is as though everything is a miracle, and one is as though nothing is a miracle. And to me, it's, it's the exact same thing that the big book says. Make a choice, okay? It's either... God is all or nothing. Don't ride the fence. I mean, if you don't believe it, God, fine. But hold, you know, hold back to that theory even when things are going going badly. So that was a that was a real eye opener for me too. To just kind of you know to make you have to make that choice. And and you know I have to tell you guys that since I have I've like completely given myself to the program. I mean it's it's just it's amazing. I mean it's it's I have to watch what I pray for at this point because like I. You know, I get what I pray for. It's the truth. I swear to you, like, you know, prayers do come true. I mean, it's been a long, slow process. You know, I can't Mm -hmm. get it all back right away, you know, as we all, you know, want. I mean, it it does take time, but, you know, again, 12 and a half years in, and and I've seen so many, so many miracles, a a lot of little things that, that I would have missed when I was still drinking. I mean, I told you my kids were young when I got sober, I think my oldest was nine. And I'm thankful that they never, they don't really have any memories of me as a drunk, you know, and I, that's one thing, mm-hmm. one thing I'm really thankful for. Um, but, you know, just like things like getting to coach their little league baseball teams and um, my youngest is, is my only daughter. And, you know, I, one year after I got sober, after sober a couple of years, I went to a, a daddy-daughter dance with her. It was like a Girl Scout thing. Hmm. Oh. All these little things, the little things. I mean, when, if I was still drinking, I wouldn't have had any interest in going and stuff like that. And they wouldn't have wanted me there. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. just, it's those little things, the little tiny miracles. I mean, some are smaller than others, some not so small, but just, you, you know, you, I feel like you have to look for that stuff in, in your daily life and to be thankful for that. And I'm a firm believer that, um, 
that those things are all around us every day, you know, if you're looking for them. I mean, it just, it depends on your, on your point of view, really. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, things have just, you know, I mean, things have gotten so much better for me today. I, I mean, I still do work in the industry. Uh, I still do get to go to conferences now. And when the, and when the, uh, cocktail party start, I, you know, I'll either get Diet Pepsi and hang around for a little bit or I'll go back to my room and, you know, kick up my feet. I don't need to, you know, put on airs and pretend like, you know, mm-hmm. I don't need to, uh, put on a show for anybody. Um, yeah. you know, because I, I know, I know how easy it would be and I know what would happen. I, I mean, I told you, I, I watched it kill my brother and who am I to think I would be any, any different than my story with him? I'm no better than him. And, you know, I, I yeah. know exactly what would happen if I go back out there, you know, but, um, you know, it's just, I mean, I'm just so thankful that I eventually found my way back into the rooms of AA and, uh, well, they're actually there are no rooms of AA right now. Well, at least here in Western Pennsylvania, we're doing it virtually. I'm assuming you guys are doing the same yeah. thing. Yeah. there too because of the pandemic. And, and that's fine for guys like me. Um, but I do, I do want to go a little bit of a tangent, you know, with a new guy, you know, I, I just wonder what that's mm-hmm. like for the newcomer nowadays, like not having that, you know, eye to eye, face to face, that handshake, oh, yeah. that hug. I, I, I just worry that it, it's got to be a problem for new people because I know how important that stuff's that, well, you know, early on, just somebody to look you in the eye and say it's going to be okay. It's, it's a little bit different doing it over, a, you know, a Zoom call or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, just, I guess I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, that's a short version of my story. Uh, but um, I think I hit on all the high points there. Or the low points, whatever, however you want to, like, call it. <laughs> right. Uh, would you like to go first, Allie, or would you like one of us to go first? Um, let me, you guys can go, because uh, I just, uh, I, have a, I mean, I can go. It doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, I can just make a couple comments and then maybe ask a question. I could, uh, Ken, it was really good to hear, you know, your story, uh, your message. Um, I could really relate to a lot of what you said. And something that you said totally brought back a memory for me that, like, I had totally forgotten about. Uh, I was about like 16, 17 and uh, my sister lives in this like, a, like basically abandoned house um, in a heavily wooded area around where we live. And um, man, we had a party and uh, we had all these bottles and somebody brought Bacardi 151, right? And like, who drinks There's that? There's always so, that guy. Dude, <laughs> he bought two handles of Bacardi 151. And look, oh, we drank all of this stuff. All of the shit was gone by the end of the party, except for that 151, and I remember the next day waking up and chasing that stuff with water, doing oh, shots. Yeah. So when you said, so when you said you were like mixing the vodka with the water in the park, man, yep. like it just like touched that part of my like soul that was like, oh god, I know that feeling. <laughs> you know what I mean? That like oh. utter desperation and just, oh, yeah. how did this happen? Anything to cut it with, right? I, I, I mean, my hat's off to anybody who can drink that stuff straight because you're going to be more of a man than I am. <laughs> I, no. Oh, God. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, no. I, I, was, um, I, was, I was a straight rum and whiskey drinker, and I don't think it makes me more of a man. It probably just makes me more of a degenerate. <laughs> Uh, right. I was a Southern that. Comfort girl. I was I drank Southern Comfort of like I was in Joplin or something. Like I, I even and I used to drink Bacardi. I remember we came up with a slogan: "A party ain't a party without Bacardi." I mean, I'm surprised it hasn't been picked up by Bacardi. That you know, anyway. Um, and it was funny too because I didn't. I had a drinking problem, but if I came up with a slogan for alcohol, you would think that that would be like that right. a problem. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess that kind of segues. Yeah, right. I, I kind of segues into my um, question. You know, you talked a lot about like different various points in your drinking where like, you know, it was it was bad. But like, was there a point when you kind of like knew like this could be a problem? Um, maybe I should do something about it or just I don't know, like just that one opening eye opening experience where like you just knew you had a problem and uh, maybe you weren't really ready not. or as crazy as it sounds. Really always, and again, I didn't know what alcoholism was. I, I, I did not know. And I really think that I just thought, I drink differently. This is the way Ken has to drink. I'm just different yeah. than other people, okay? I, it's not that, you have a, that I have a problem. It's just I can't drink like you people. And believe me, I tried. You know, the big book talks about the various ways. And I mean, I could, 
I could tell you, you know, I would go to parties at my, we, you know, let's say at my sister's house, and I would say tonight is going to be the night that I don't, you know, that I'm not the one saying, why doesn't she get him the hell out of here? You know what I mean? It was always, <laughs> that's the way the parties ended for 10 M. Please tell her to get him out of here now, you know? And so I would, I would go, I remember this one time, I, I put like, I don't know, a dozen uh, rubber bands on my right wrist. And because I was convinced that the problem was I would lose track of how many I had. And I thought, okay, well, all mm-hmm. of those, I'll just transfer the rubber band to the other arm after every drink. And then I'll be able to keep track. And if I keep track, then, well, of course, everything will be fine. And, you know, that, of course, that next morning I woke up. Probably on the bathroom floor. Some of the rubber bands are probably around my ankle. I don't know. But, you know, needless to say, it didn't work. But, but to answer your question, no, not really. Until that moment that I, I described kind of the morning after losing the job at the at the post office. That, and by the way, no surprise there. That, I did lose that job. I know you guys will be surprised to hear that. The post office yeah. was not happy with my, uh, with my performance that night. Apparently, I like, we had key cards there. And so they could, like, keep track of you going in and out of the building. And apparently, like... I went out because I had beer in the car, of course, and, you know, when I slammed the beer, I don't know, maybe five or six times that night. And um, so, yeah, eventually they asked me not to come back. But, um, but no, until that morning, it just kind of the, like, I don't know, when I, I just remember seeing my wife that morning and I look on her face and that, that was it. That was the surrender moment for me. I just knew that, you know, I needed help. I just remember thinking I need help. Okay. All right. All right. Um... Would you like to go next, Eric? Sure, David. Um, yeah, that's all that's right. kind of weird for you to go last, but yeah, let's. Uh, um, all right, hey, Ken. You know, so um, yeah, I know, I know. It's okay, David. Um, I'm <laughs> so, Ken, you know, you you spoke a lot. I mean, you spoke spoke a little bit about the um, spirituality um, towards the end of your story, and you know how you kind of had. Almost, I, I don't even want to call it an expectation, but you were talking about how you kind of had like your wife's God, and if there was like a time <clears> for <throat> your, you know, for that God to show up, yep. it would be now. Um, and you, I mean, you have a lot of time now, right? Like, I mean, you're on 12 and a half years, and something um, that I've actually been asking a lot of people, because um, I'm, I'm a bit curious about it, is how, you know, you had a much different, um, conception of what God was during active, um, alcoholism. How has your, not your concept of God, but how has your concept of spirituality evolved since that point of when you started your journey in recovery to where you are now? That's a a good question. And the the thing that springs to mind, I'm not sure the the exact answer, but but the, the first thing I think of is, that I'm just so much more aware now of how God is everything. You know what I mean? It's not a sometimes thing. It's like at any time during the day, like here, I'll tell you one thing. I'm convinced that God speaks to me through the radio a lot of times. <laughs> like, it's just so weird. I don't know if you guys have ever had this experience, but like I'll be in the car driving and I'll be, you know, my head's running. I'm thinking about something. And so many times this happens where like the, the lyrics or the next thing out of the, you know, the radio host's mouth is something that is so easy for me to, you know, to attribute to exactly the, the problem I was just mulling over. I mean, it, it's uncanny how much it happens. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of some problem, and the next lyric is, you know, God telling me what the answer is. I don't, call me crazy if you want, I don't care. You know, but I'm just, my point is that I really think that there are signs out there every day, all the time. But God is constantly communicating with us. The problem is we don't see it. You know, we're, we're all waiting for the burning bush. And it just, that's not the way this works. But I think if you're, if you're quiet and you're open and receptive to the idea that, like, he may be trying to talk to you, that those answers are there. I really believe that. And so that's a long-winded way to answer your question. But I think I'm just so much more of a constantly, you know, every minute, every, you know, of the day. It's not like, oh, wait, there's a problem or you know, it's like, I'm, I try to be constantly aware of, like, God's running the show here, not me. And all I have to do is just stop and, like, turn it over to him and think about it for a minute and, and listen to what I'm supposed to be doing, you know. And I, I, and that takes time. I mean, that's not something I think you get right away. It, it, it's a, it's something you have to kind of work at, I think. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an exercise that builds 
uh, builds up as, as you do it more and more kind of thing. So uh, I'm not sure I answered your question, but. No, and it's, I mean, it's it's completely up to you on what your conception is, right? Like, that's the beauty of the yeah. program. It doesn't really matter mm-hmm. what you believe in. Um, you don't really necessarily have to believe. But as long as it works for you, that's really all that matters. Right, right. Hey, hey, let me, can I tell you one more quick story that, that, that just made me think of? Of course. Yeah. You guys have, okay, so I'm about six months sober at this point. Okay, but we're still living at my mother-in-law's. It's Easter, okay? Remember, I got I got sober in October, so I don't know where Easter fell that year, but still, I'm six months sober. And you know how it is in early recovery. Some great day, some horrible day. You know, up and down, up and down. This particular Easter, so this would have been the Easter of 2008, I'm having a bad day. You know, just no reason. I don't know. I wake up and realize I'm still living at my mother-in-law's. Things aren't going the way I want, whatever. You know, it was just, it was a bad, bad day. So we go to, I don't like Catholic, but my, my wife and her family, they're all Catholic. So we go to Catholic Mass. If you're not familiar, it's a pretty long, when you go on Easter, yeah. you're in for a pretty long, pretty long yep. day. So it's, you know, stand, sit, kneel, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like <laughs> seeing red. I'm just, you know what I mean? I'm just like, I'm just pissed off this day for whatever reason, for no reason, really. And... So here's this picture of me at this mass, you know, I'm wearing my suit, I'm uncomfortable, you know, and I've got this cross that I wear around my neck, a gold cross on a chain. I've always worn it. You know? So right, I don't know if you guys are familiar again, but during the Eastern Mass, a lot of times they, the priest will go around and um, like splash the, the holy water on the congregation. I, I'm not a Catholic, so I don't want to try to explain it about that. But then, you know, they go yeah. up and down the aisle. So right before the priest gets to where we were sitting, I feel this trickle going down in front of my chest. And I'm like, what the hell is that? He hasn't hit me with the water yet. And I realized that this gold cross I wear on my chain had fallen down. And it's fallen down. And, and I'm, I, you know, again, you guys believe whatever you want to call me crazy. I never had any trouble with that cross before. Never. Not once. And I, and I never did after that either. The cross had fallen off its chain. And I'm like, oh my God. When I realized what had happened, I was terrified because I was sitting there and thinking all these black thoughts and I'm like, you dumbass. Like, look at what he's done for you. You know, and you're going to sit here in his house and think these horrible thoughts, you know, these horrible, hateful thoughts. He's done with you. Like he's going to strike you down right here and now. And he doesn't want you wearing his symbol when he does it. I mean, that's really what I saw. I'm waiting for the, the roof to open up and the lightning bolt to come in, you know. And it didn't, of course, it didn't happen. And, you know, when I thought about it later on, and again, this isn't me thinking, like, God's talking directly to me. Like, I'm somebody important. I'm telling you, that I, this goes back to what I said earlier. I think the signs are there all the time. If you look for them, I really do. And, and I think it was just, I mean, hey, idiot i got this i'm here relax okay relax i'm here and uh you know and that's that's how it went down and you know, i'll never forget that i was just so so terrified but uh but um you know it, it was just a, it was, to me it was just a good learning tool all right all right uh last but not least i'll i'll ask my question now um so do you believe that uh alcoholism and addiction is more about the habit or the mental obsession than the actual substance itself? Yeah, that's a tough one. You know, cause like I'm, I'm just one of those guys growing up that I was always told, Oh, you've got an addictive personality. I, I was like, always going over the top with everything. You know, I'm collecting baseball cards and suddenly it's like, that's my whole life. It's like getting all the baseball cards. That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't, I really don't know. I mean, because to me, like, I, alcohol fell right into that pattern that I had always kind of that I had already established as far as like when I found something I liked or wanted, like I would, we did it to the hills, and I was mm-hmm. certainly the same way with drinking. You know, I, I mean, it just became my whole life. Um, so I, I mean, I'm certainly a believer that there is a hereditary slash genetic, you know, component. Uh, yeah. the, the, and I mean, I'm not a scientist or a doctor, so I'm not speaking from that that part of it. But it does run through my family tree. My I, uh, my mother, I didn't want to get into this earlier because that's kind of her story. But my mother is, well, she's dead now, but she was an alcoholic. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't anything like overtly like you see drank at night. We never really saw it, and 
But that's probably a story for another day. My dad's dad was an alcoholic, so my dad really kind of went the other way. He grew up with an alcoholic, he didn't show. And I'm just mm-hmm. telling you this because, like, I'm, I'm convinced that it runs in the family, and that scares the shit out of me tonight because I've got four kids here now. Two of them are, you know, they're all like older teens, early twenties, and I'm like, why? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, well, if I'm right and it runs in the family tree, then you know. Odds are that one of these kids, you know, very well could, could end up like that. That's, I've been very open with them, and they they all know my story, and they've known it for years. And you know, we'll just cross that bridge when we get there, I guess. But um, <laughs> so far, so good, I guess on on that end. Mm. All right, all right, Allie. Do you have any uh, more questions? Um, no. No, okay. I think I'm good. Well, actually, you know what? Now that I think about it, I do have one question. Um, yeah. You said you, you know, you travel a lot for work, and I'm sure there's yeah. like mixers, and you know, I just moved to a new neighborhood, and I was so unaware of like how drink culture is like a way of life. Mm-hmm. So, like, do people when you go to events and you, you know, you might not be drinking, or they say, "What can I get you to drink?" Do they like ask you, like, "Hey, why don't you drink?" or What's going on? Or I mean, do you have you ever feel like that's a problem that you run into? It's so funny because it's like when you're just getting sober, that those questions always seem like it's going to be such a big deal. Like, oh my god, like I can't think of my son's wedding or my son's. Like, what will I say with people? And it's like I don't know that I would say it's never come up, but it's like I think we worry about those kinds of things in early recovery way too much. It's like, no, it. Mm-hmm. I mean. If, if anybody asks me, first of all, it's a rude question to ask somebody, you know, <laughs> and I mean, it's really good. I just feel like, yeah. I mean, I think I would just like laugh it off now. I don't have to go into some, oh, I'm in recovery, you know, kind of thing. I mean, well, I would just feel like I'm yeah. telling a guy, go, dude, move on. I mean, you know, it's not a big deal. Like, but I can remember thinking those thoughts, like, oh, you know, what would I say to somebody, you know, oh, 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 they would know that I'm not drinking like they are. I mean, I don't give it a second thought. No, I'm doing me, buddy, you do you, and and we'll, we'll be fine here, but it never, it never comes out. Never. Hmm. That's All right. good. You're awesome. So I actually want right. to, um, I want to, I want to add something to kind of like that, that question. Cause I mean that, that's something I, I, I'm like very, I come across drink culture a lot <clears throat> with weddings. Um, I used to like film weddings and like oh, for, yeah. for work, um, or for like sports stuff, like I used to play sports before I tore up my leg, like uh, before these last two surgeries, um, and you know with with doing like work, you know I, I right now I'm not because of COVID, but with traveling, you know you go to a <laughs> lot of functions, and you know there's there's like a meeting, and then there's an after meeting, and there's dinner, and there might be like a happy hour, um, and it's a weird situation, right? Because you need saying like you need to you attend gotta network, the, man. You, you have to network yeah. like especially with work and like with meeting new people in like a situation like you know going to like a neighborhood gathering like it's good to know like it's good to network um but i i mean i agree with ken where it's like very few people ask and it usually when people do ask like it's more of like what's up with you like are you that uncomfortable like if i don't have a drink in my hand like that's kind of right. like what's going on? Like, <laughs> yeah. like you can't have a drink. Like unless I have a drink. Like I'm not drinking. Um, and I always that's go kind with of a form of gaslighting, don't you think? What? Aren't you like gaslighting that person a little bit? You're just like flipping that's it around on them. And like maybe there's something wrong with you. Well, I don't say it to <laughs> them, you know. But I'm like, that's what I'm thinking. Is I'm like, I'm like really oh, like okay, you're okay. no. I, I I'm of course like a, a million times more like polite. And I'm just like no, like because of health reasons. Because I have like a lot of health things that go on. I'm just like because of health reasons, I don't drink. And it's true, right? I'm yeah, I'm but like you're an like addict. you're you're like backhandedly polite though. No, that's just the way you interpret it, David. <laughs> because you don't know how to take my, you know, the way I the way I am. It's it's okay. You're not polite. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was just gonna say, I'm not very food. That's true. One thing I should have mentioned this earlier, I mean, I got sober at 41. So, I mean, I don't know what it's like. I still, my heart goes out to young people uh, that are trying to get sober at 18, 19, because, you know, peer pressure obviously is huge at that age level compared to, like, when I got sober. And so, and I think that probably bleeds into what we're talking about now. If you're younger, any kind of get-together, yeah, it's much more likely to be an issue with your friends at that age than, than yeah. you know, I was a middle-aged guy at that point. But um, and another, another point, it's funny you bring it up because I think I mentioned one of you guys 
when we were setting this up that I just wrote a novel that's loosely based on my own story here. And uh, guy I used to work for, uh, company before the one I work for now, he ordered the book. And, and I said, oh, you know, we're just chatting about it. And I had never talked to this guy about my story. And he said, oh, I can't remember how the conversation went, but he said, oh, I always kind of thought maybe you were, you know, in recovery. And I said, really? I, you know, I just kind of thought like I had hidden it well. And he brought up this time, like right after I had gotten hired and they had all taken me out. And, you know, there I am, like the only guy at the table drinking Diet Coke or whatever. And I just, I didn't really think it was a big deal, except that I was the new guy with the company. So, I mean, I was a little uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, like, hey, you ready for an extra round of beers? And I'm like, I'm good, you know. But, yeah, but all along, he said he had kind of, I guess he had seen me in events, you know, over the years, a couple of different times, like turning down alcohol. And, and it, it, it had run through his mind. And he, he was not surprised to hear that I was in recovery, but um, but there was like no pressure, and, and I never really felt any need to tell anybody. It wasn't like, hey man, come on, come on, come on, what's going on the drink? It was not, I never had any pressure like that. No, yeah, and it's usually it was usually it's usually like when I'm at um, like conferences, and it's usually the younger like um, coworkers who are in their early twenties, like out of college, uh, maybe mid twenties, and like I remember being in my mid twenties and. You know, it's it's a it's a fun time to do stuff like that, but you Dude, know, that was like five years ago. Of course, you remember it. Well, it was a much <laughs> different time, though, David. Like than where I am now. It was a different time. You Obama know? was in the office. Things it were was good. a different. It was a different time. People. It was a different. <laughs> it was a different era. Man. It was a different time in like I don't know. My life has evolved a lot since like that period. Of time, <laughs> you know, I'm busting your balls, Eric. It's okay, David. It's okay. Go ahead. Okay, Ask your I, question. I, Go I, ahead. One, one, Jesus. See, this is what I'm talking about. Backhandedly <laughs> polite. <laughs> okay. There was a tone. There was a tone there, Eric. <laughs> All right. My, this is my last question. So how have you gone about making amends to your family? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one, right? I mean, that's, and that's a, to me, again, it's a long process. Like, that's something mm-hmm. that has happened over the years. I mean, I still, especially with my kids, like, I still feel like, even though they were so young, when this, you know, like, in some ways, I feel like I'll never be able to make it up to them because, like, the trickle-down effect, especially, like, economically, financially, like, I'll never be where I could have been, you know, you could say should have been because of the drinking. And so I still feel like, you know, stuff will come up and it's like, you know, I mean, I still get those guilt things, but, you know, I want to, like, apologize all the time. Like, I'm sorry that I can't pay for your college education. Mm-hmm. You know, like, we're taking out student loans because I was drunk for 20 years from, you know, age 20 to 40. So, mm-hmm. I mean, for me, it's like, I, I, a lot of times, well, I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's uh, on a, like, a case-by-case, you know, incident-by-incident basis where, I mean, I have sat them all down. We've had this conversation. All my kids, mm-hmm. my wife, you know, her mother, extended family, brothers and sisters. But I still feel like as individual incidents come up and it, like, hits home with me, like, you know what? Like, you can't run and hide from this. This is because of what you did. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I'll still feel the need a lot of times to say, hey, you know, I'm sorry. Like, I screwed up. I screwed up bad. And, like, that's why we're, you know, we're still having these you know, financial problems. And, and a lot of times, especially with my kids, I mean, they'll brush it off. I think they see the bigger picture. Hey, we're glad you're still around, you know, that you didn't mm-hmm. yourself to death, you know, like easily could have happened. Um, but so, yeah, to answer your question, I think it's, I, to me, it's something that will probably never go away. I think I'll always be, as things come up, I'll be, you know, yeah. telling people, hey, look, you know, I screwed up and I'm sorry. Absolutely. Uh, Is it about that time, Eric? Sure, David. Go ahead. Do your do your little thing. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the best part of the show. It's time to go to the Twitter. Good job. I feel like we need music or something. Thank you, <laughs> Allie. Yes, we do. A drum roll. Um, maybe yes. one day. One one I day. Have a co-signer. Maybe I have one a day. Co-signer. Maybe one day. Um. So. All right. What do we got? So uh, the way this works, Ken, is um. I'm going to ask the question and then you'll go first. Um, and then uh, I guess David, then Allie, then myself. And I'm actually going to change the question a little bit, guys. Um, but this is from Major. 
And uh, cons- okay. considering, yeah, considering that we are in the COVID-19 um, epidemic right now, it's, it's COVID-19 related. Hopefully by the time this episode comes out, we are out of that, um, though I'm not too sure about that. So I'm going to add a little bit to this question, but it's how do you find an online um, or video conferencing meeting? Um, and to add on to that is what value do you find in the online community for the fellowships and are you going to continue doing online meetings uh, once the you know stay at home and the social distancing has been lifted? Mm. Okay. Um, you guys want me to go first? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just, the first part of it, if you're asking how to find the meetings, I'm a little bit technologically challenged. I'm a little older than you guys, I think. So maybe <laughs> I'll just kind of defer that part to you guys. But, um, I don't, I mean, personally, I've always done a little bit of that. Like, if I'm, especially, you know, we're talking about traveling, like, if I'm on the road, like, I, I will sometimes in the hotel room, I will grab the laptop and just find a, you know, a recovery site and find when the meeting's going on, that kind of thing. So I've always kind of done that. Obviously, not to the degree that we're all doing it now. I kind of like it, but again, I do, like I mentioned earlier, I, I think it's easier maybe if you've got a little bit more time under your belt than mm-hmm. somebody new. Uh, it's not the same. I mean, there's just no way that you can duplicate that interaction, that, you know, human to human interaction. Um, but I mean, to me, other than that, like, there is still definitely a lot of value. I mean, it's definitely better than sitting and getting inside your own head on a given night, you know, while we're home every day. I would definitely encourage people to, to check it out. Um, will I keep doing it? Yeah, I think so to some degree. But like I said, I, I always had it. I, I think I will probably, I'll probably be more burned out of it after doing it for you know, a month after a month here. I'll probably take a little bit of a break, but I think I will always do it to some degree. All right. Um, this is, this is a really good question. Um, there, I've actually found this really amazing website. It's called podcastrecovery.com. They have all these episodes of like really great speakers from all over the world. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That was a shameless plug. Sorry. Um, that was terrible. Um, apologies. No, Eric loved it. Um, I, I'm going to be honest. I have not attended a single zoom meeting. I I'm hundred percent honest. I have not. Um, I've been, oh my God. By, yep. I haven't, I, I've, I've been sticking. Well, and to, to be fair, Eric and I, uh, have had a very rigorous podcast recovery schedule over the last two months. So we've been having seven four, to 10 speakers, four to seven, like four a to, week. yeah, four to seven meetings a week. So, I mean, we, we have, a full I mean, there were, there were, there, yeah, there was there. Yeah. There was one week when it was like two triples and, uh, and a double. So that, that was eight, eight different speakers from all over the world in a, in a week. So like, that was a lot of, um, uh, amazing recovery that like I, I got to experience. So I, I've still, I've still remained connected and I'm talking to my sponsor like every other day I'm texting people. Um, so like, um, I, I, technology has given me the advantage to really n- not drift too far away from like the, the people in my network that I love. Like I, I get to text them every day. Um, Twitter has an, has an amazing online community, um, hashtag recovery posse, uh, look it up and, and there's amazing stuff. There's, it, it's a really positive community. Um, I, Ali is going to be probably the, the expert on where to find meetings. Um, but they're, they're out there and I love them a lot. I like, I mean, obviously Eric and I love what technology can do for recovery. Cause just last week we were talking to a guy in England and like a, a couple of weeks ago we were talking to somebody in California. So technology has this ability to really bring us all together and, and, and share, share some hope in, in these really like troubling times. So check out Facebook, check out Twitter. You can find, you can find uh, speaker meetings on YouTube. Um, so it, it's out there. You, you got to do a little bit of, of the legwork, but it's out there. And yeah, I'm going to continue uh, with technological recovery for as long as, uh, 
for as long as I can. What about you, Allie? Um, so to, to answer the first question, um, I have been to my home group. Uh, we have been meeting through Zoom meetings. And um, when this first happened and the stay-at-home order was put into place, uh, a lot of people in my like network and area and region um, started making Facebook pages of just all of the different Zoom meetings that were happening all over. Um, so I've just been kind of getting on those Facebook pages and um, finding like the I guess the codes so that I can join. And when I get on them, somebody's always celebrating. Um, they have announcements, so I try to get the Zoom codes from that. Um, you know, I actually have people too in my network that have been like sending me messages. Hey, uh, someone's are celebrating, someone's are sharing this meeting. Um, if you want to attend, um, I personally, um, I grew up like, I like love hugging people. I'm an extrovert. I love just like uh-huh. I'm the person that goes to target and like touches everything that I see unnecessarily just because like I can, and I just, I don't know. It's just who I am. So like, Thank I, you love the fact that we can have these meetings online, but it's just not the same. Like, I just like want to fucking hug my home group members. Like I want to like, I mean, like I, my husband's in recovery and like, like I can you know, hug him every day, but like, I just miss the like one-on-one interactions and like just seeing people's faces. I'm like watching growth. Like, you know, seeing somebody come in and you're like, Oh shit, they're new. Are they going to stay? Do they think they're, you know, they, they can, how can I help mm-hmm. them? Like, I feel like that aspect of my recovery has been kind of taken away and uh, I'm kind of missing it. You know, I really am. Um, yeah. it's like, it's like we can all get on this cool cam thing and we can see each other's faces, but like, man, I'm an addict. Like I'm, I'm a, like, I, I identify that. So like, I, you know, I can put on a pretty face and act like everything's okay. But when you physically see me sitting in a chair, and like I, I can't hide it. Like I, I like a, a side of me that I can't hide behind. Like the mask is is it's exposed, yeah. and I don't know. It just it forces me to like share. And like if somebody if somebody on a Zoom meeting is like, "Hey, Allie, how's it going?" I can be like, "Oh, it's fine, I'm great." But if somebody sees me in a meeting and I'm like fidgeting and I'm moving, they're gonna be like, "Are you sure you're okay?" You know, yeah. just like that. That is what I miss, and I do miss. Um, I miss the coffee, right? <laughs> I guess I miss um, what. I, yeah. I do. I I I do. Like I think I miss Starbucks. Going to Starbucks more than um, the coffee, didn't, like the meeting. You know, I just miss the whole the whole That's process. Awesome. I miss barista, babe. I, I know. Right? Gotta, I'm gonna have to stop by tomorrow for a special order. And I also I miss you. the meeting after the meeting. Like yeah. I just I miss it. I miss all of it. Um, you know. So I probably it's. If, like, I needed the meeting and I couldn't get to one, yeah, like, I'm going to get online and try to, you know, get my recovery, um, you know, be a part of it as best I can. But I am going to get my ass. I swear to God, the moment that the um, stay-at-home order is lifted, I'm going to be like, what meeting is tonight? I'm hugging every person. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm just, me, yeah, I me too. Know, like, yeah, right? like, I don't know. So I, um, I also, That's going to be the biggest um, fucking meeting ever. I know, right? And it's gonna be like, um, just yeah, like it's gonna be like my first, first meeting again, like just the camaraderie and both love and the fellowship. Um, but I really miss seeing everyone's faces and I like the hugs. God, like I had no idea how important a hug has become to who I am. Eric does not miss my the spirituality. Hug. Well, Eric, we're going to get you there, all right? David and I are going to get you. I don't yeah, know. I just guys. love hugging. Like, it, it's a hug is a spiritual experience between two people, and um, I miss yeah. it, so. I mean. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll still, I'll still do it if I need to, but I'm going to take my ass to the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> if I can. <laughs> if I can. <laughs> so. Um, hmm. I mean, it's been eight years, Allie. I, I don't think at this point, you know, I, I'm going to get to the point of where, you know, the hug is going to, you know, be be a thing like that I enjoy. Um, so it takes time, bud. It just it it things, things like this take time. Do you know what bothers me? I've, I've talked about this a lot. You know, when you circle up at the end of a meeting and it's it's the middle of July. Right. 
and it's like a hundred <laughs> degrees and it's fucking humid and like you gotta circle up and you know, either fellowship, right? You either gotta hold hands or you gotta like you know ugh, the, wrap the, your arms yeah. around them. Gross. Gross, gross, like my bot I'm just like, oh yeah, I don't like it. Everyone's sweaty and like where and he have you makes been? a beeline he makes a beeline to the bathroom right afterwards. Yep, I wash my hands. You, I do. Eric, you just gotta like you gotta before it's gotta be like premeditated. You're gonna look around the room and be like, Who can I feel comfortable enough to stand I, this close to? Yeah, I do you know, that okay? guys. And I do so that. And them. every once in a while <laughs> that does not work out. And we all have been there. We all understand what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah. It does not always work oh yeah but to to stay on topic right um how to find online and video conferencing meetings um so zoom um you can also go to many of the different fellowship sites and they'll take you anywhere that you need to go i i know that smart recovery has had like a forum set up for years um i know different we had another guest on probably months back by now but um they're actually using Discord, which is a popular video game uh, like communication app where I used to play like CS. Oh, yeah. And uh, they would use Discord. And there's different privacy settings, right? Like the problem with Zoom is there's like issues with privacy. We're using Google Hangouts right now for this call. That's another option. Um, you could do like if you wanted to do a small intimate group, you could do like FaceTime if everyone what like has uh, Apple products or you could do Skype. Um but there's, there's lots of different ways, and you can get creative, um, even just a conference call. I mean, this is essentially what we're on right now is a conference call, um, and we're talking about recovery. Yeah. It doesn't have to be face-to-face. Um, and, you know, I've been actually talking with my sponsor. My sponsor lives in Virginia. He does not live that far away. I have been down there to, like, chair meetings before and to um, visit him, but uh, you know, we, when we talk, we either use FaceTime or, or now we use Zoom. So, you know, even like with sponsorship, like that is a way that I personally have been doing online meetings for a long time. Um, Mm -hmm. I think, Ken, you bring up a good point. We've talked about this, I know, because this has been a popular topic with COVID. Um, The newcomer, that is, that's the biggest worry, right? Is like the newcomer, I remember when I first came into recovery, I went to a ton of meetings. And yes, I did need that hug back then. Um, not yeah. not as much now, but I did need it back then. Like I needed the uh, hug. Okay. I needed I needed it to smoke. I needed the meeting okay. after the meeting. I needed all that stuff, right? And that is it is scary that like you know you don't have that right now because I needed a meeting yeah. as much as I needed a drug, like in those first ninety days. <clears throat> so that's yeah. worrisome, but like kind of going like glass half full. I think something really cool that's going to come out of this is there's um, a pamphlet in uh, NA um, called getting, uh, I think it's called getting clean in isolation. I have it somewhere over there, but it's, Mm -hmm. you know, I think this is really going to help people who don't have access to a meeting. Cause I mean, you know, you live close to Pittsburgh. We live close, you know, we live like in Baltimore, like meetings are, are accessible here. Like it's pretty easy to get to meetings. Right. But if you right. are an hour away from a meeting, you know, just like a food desert where you're an hour away from a grocery store, it's not convenient to just pick yeah. up and go. So I do like you that. You said food desert? Yeah. I mean, I'm comparing the two. I know it's I know it's lofty, but it's similar concept, similar concept. You need food. No, you need I've never a meeting. heard of that. But, what, a food desert? No, I get it. No, it's perfect. Um, I know. I've never really. Uh, I, we, get it. We, we, I, I get the context. OK, um, so. I think what's really cool is that I think people will continue to do this. And I think the people Mm -hmm. that didn't know as much like that this was even an option um, and now the community is larger. I think that's going to help people who can't readily get to a meeting, Um, you know, because Mm -hmm. either they live too far away. Maybe their schedule is too busy. Like life gets busy, right? Like we can't go to meetings as much as we used to. So I, I see real benefit, like at least like I'm trying to think glass you know, half full where long term, long term, I think the online community is going to like become a foundation for people's recovery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Love it. Cool. And oh, widen your network. Yeah. The what? network. 
and it'll widen everyone's network. So instead of like my my network is like people within my immediate area, you know, like I'm gonna start having a network in a different state. So that way, if I just visit that state, I'll already be yeah. plugged in. Mm-hmm. And, and it's gonna it, it's normalizing it for a lot of people because like in the very beginning, people were really weirded out by the Zoom, but now people are used to it. So I, I think in the future, if, if they need it, they'll be like, oh, yeah. And then they can just go back to it and feel comfortable. So that's good. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well, it looks like we're about out of time. So we would like to thank our guest, Ken, for joining us. Woo! Yay! Thanks for having me. Um, so, Ken, no problem. Thanks for having me. Um, where can uh, our listeners uh, find your book and find anything else that, that you're currently doing? Yes, I'm glad you asked about the book. So uh, it's called One Hand on the Sink. It's a novel, but it's loosely based on uh, my own experience. Uh, It's very, very recovery heavy and uh, drinking heavy, and it's available on Amazon. It's only $2.99, I think, for the e-book and $5.99 for the paperback. Um, It just came out about a month ago. I'm very happy with it, with the way it turned out. Um, I'm really hoping that people in recovery or people in need of recovery uh, will read it and get something from it. And again, so one hand on the sink and you can find it on Amazon. Awesome. Mm. All right. Nice. Well, here at Podcast Recovery, we are aiming to expand the scope of support for recovering addicts. Accessibility and convenience of helpful services is paramount to combating addiction. We work to bring the message of recovery to every addict, wherever and whenever it is needed. We believe that a powerful voice of recovery should be obtainable, practical, and at the touch of a button. Every addict deserves to hear a message of hope, and Podcast Recovery is here to provide it. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. Make sure you check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, our YouTube channel. For more information about Eric and I, go to podcastrecovery.com. But most importantly, everybody out there, stay safe and stay clean.